It's great to be here in Singapore. I've been really overwhelmed with, uh, with the uh, reception uh, and the enthusiasm that I've uh, observed in all the different venues that we've been in so far. So thank you for your interest in space. What I would like, hope to do tonight is maybe personalize it, humanize it a little bit and give you an idea of vicariously what it's like uh, to go to space and to participate in, in the current uh, chapter of human exploration, uh, what we call the International Space Station. Uh, this is the view that you have up there and we're all inspired by that, right? We love space, all of us do. Uh, there's, I, I don't meet anybody that's not inspired by the vantage point that uh, you have to view, uh, as an example, to look back on the Earth and see uh, the details of the Earth like this. In a few minutes, I'm going to show a video and give you some more examples of, of uh, zoomed up uh, detail or zoomed in detail of, uh, of the Earth, uh, what you can see from this vantage point, which is the International Space Station. And uh, how many here have seen the space station fly over? Quite a few of you, good. The uh, homework assignment for the rest of you is to, uh, is to go get one of those apps that are out there or go to a website on the internet uh, that will give you the predictions on when you'll be able to see the, uh, the, the space station fly over. If you haven't done it, those of you that have done it, you know it's very inspiring to be able to see it fly over. It's the brightest thing in the night sky with the exception of the moon. And to know uh, that there are people on board uh, currently six, a uh, crew of six, which is the standard crew size and the international crew uh, living and working up there. And if you get involved and in, in, uh, get on the NASA website and follow the activities along in either the NASA site or other sites out there, that then you get engaged actually with the activities that are currently going on. Uh, and then to see it fly over is, is really inspirational. So I encourage you to do that if you haven't done it before. Of course, the challenge here in Singapore is finding the, uh, a cloudless night, right? When you do see it fly over is uh, usually uh, right after sunset or right before sunrise when it's dark here on the surface of the earth and the light is still shining on the space station uh, and it's so bright because of the size of it and those solar arrays, the wings out on the, the left and right which reflect the sun's uh, light and, and make it a, a bright object unit from the uh, surface of the earth. The space station is an incredible accomplishment in and of itself. Uh, the first element was launched in 1998. We finished it in 2011. My first visit there was in 2000, it was just two modules, uh, very small, it was before the first uh, expedition uh, launched to the space station. We use that term expedition to refer to the crews that go there and live there for a long period of time, the standard length of time nowadays is about six months. Uh, we launched Expedition 1 in the fall of 2000. And a lot of people around the world don't realize that since the fall of 2000, we've had continuous human presence in space. Uh, currently a crew of six. In the early years, we had crews of uh, three or two. Uh, after the Columbia accident, which of course delayed the, uh, the assembly of the space station after the loss of Columbia and our friends that were on that crew, uh, the space shuttle was grounded for about three years. We had a very limited way to uh, supply the space station without being able to fly the space uh, shuttle. Uh, so we reduced the crew size from three to two. So my second flight was about halfway through assembly during that time when the shuttle was grounded and we were a crew of two. Uh, and that was a six month long flight. Uh, my Russian um, cosmonaut uh, crewmate and I uh, launched about halfway through that stay. The shuttle started flying again. Um, we got added to our crew, Tomas Ryder, who a German astronaut, um, and then we picked up assembly of the space station and then finished it up uh, when I was there again in, in 2009 and 10. It took about uh, 37, as I recall, shuttle flights to assemble the space station and then also support it during the assembly. And after that time, we, uh, we uh, of course, retired the shuttle but it accomplished its primary purpose that it was designed for to put up the space station. And along with those 37 uh, uh, shuttle launches uh, came about 40 Russian launches as well to put up the space station. So it was a huge effort when you think of it, the number of rocket launches it took to put it up there piece by piece 
over many years from 1998 to 2011. The end result is what you see here in the screen. It's very big. Uh, you, it didn't just appear there. It took a lot of work and effort piece by piece to put it up. Uh, it went together very well. Uh, it's quite an impressive uh, achievement in technology and engineering and integration at the international level where we had elements of the space station meet and be integrated the first time not on paper. On paper, uh, on the ground, it was integrated on paper. But uh, to take uh, physical components of the space station and integrate them on orbit physically for the first time in space is pretty impressive. When you're launching some elements from the U.S. and other elements from Russia uh, and Japanese elements from, from yet another location and uh, designed in, uh, all around the world. So it's quite an accomplishment. If you could lay the space station on the ground, it would be bigger than a football field. If you could put it on a scale and weigh it, it would weigh almost a million pounds. So that gives you an idea of the, the size, the scope of the, of the assembly of the space station itself. Uh, on the inside, where the crew lives and work, which is the center uh, of what you see here in the, the view, the, the stack of cylinders, if you will, the pressurized modules, um, it has the volume equivalent to about a 5,000 square foot house. Uh, so it's very roomy inside, spread out over uh, multiple modules. The crew of six then uh, is, you think we're, uh, we're all um, uh, living and working tied in a cluster for six months. That's not true. We're spread out every day working in different parts of the space station. We typically gather together for meals and whatnot. Um, but it is a huge uh, facility. A lot of potential, a lot of great history already. It's got a, a great operation ongoing right now, and it's got a, a very promising future. Uh, with doors that will continue to open to get on board even through things that were talked about earlier that uh, Badushi talked about in other venues to get experiments and, and uh, new technology on board the space station. So it's got a lot of potential, a lot of applicability for, for you all here. The space station itself is a, in an orbit inclined to the equator at 51.6 degrees. So the, the, that means uh, as it orbits the Earth, it crosses the equator, say going from south to north, and goes up to 51.6 degrees north latitude, comes back the other side, crosses the equator down to 51.6 south uh, latitude, and then, and then back up. Uh, each time it crosses the equator after a, a one orbit, uh, the Earth, of course, in a 24-hour rotation has rotated uh, so that you cross the equator about 1,500 miles or so to the west of the previous orbit. What that means is it's a near ideal orbit uh, to, for the long term to do observations of the Earth's surface. Uh, so it's a great platform for those studies. You see the entire globe except for the poles, North and South Pole. Um, and and the, the phasing of the orbit means that over days and weeks you see all those locations on the Earth in different lighting conditions, day, night, different sun angles during daytime. Uh, you watch weather patterns go by, and over weeks and months, you see seasons go by. Uh, so it's a great platform for observing uh, the Earth. Uh, backing up a little bit, the space shuttle, I said 37 launches to, uh, to get anybody here see a space shuttle launch? Quite a few of you. Yeah, it was pretty impressive, right? Very humbling to go there. You're three miles away, and then you have the power of the main engines and the solid rocket boosters that shook your whole body. Very impressive uh, to see a, a, a space shuttle launch. Very impressive to see any rocket launch. And you're going to go here in a couple weeks and see a SpaceX launch uh, down in Florida. Uh, it, it is a humbling experience to see one of those. You realize uh, you're, we're reminded when we see that it, access to space is not easy. It's uh, very difficult. Uh, but when a rocket launches to go to orbit, that the, particularly in low Earth orbit, what we call where the space station is, you're in orbit in less than nine minutes. And in that nine minutes, you're going 17,500 miles an hour. That's orbital velocity. Uh, up roughly, think, 250 miles above the Earth's surface. That means you orbit the Earth every 90 minutes or 16 times a day. 
Uh, so it's a lot of physics involved. It is rocket science. Um, <laughs> what I want to do now is I want to give you a sense of the rhythm of life on the space station program uh, by showing you a video that's about 15, if our tech supports us anyway, showing you a video that uh, is about 15 minutes long that highlights the, the last year's mission that I was uh, a participant on uh, across in, uh, the time of what we called Expedition 47 and 48. It'll start um, in, at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, which is the location that was developed in the uh, late 50s, early 60s uh, by the Soviet Union, the beginning of the space race. And we, we launched from the same launch pad and all crews now rotating on Russian Soyuz rockets to the space station launch on the same launch pad that Yuri Gagarin launched from the first uh, uh, human in space uh, many over 50 years ago now. Um, so a lot of history there. I'll talk a little bit more later perhaps in the Q&A about the international partnership uh, of all this. So Expedition 47-48, uh, this was, uh, as I said, the last flight I was on last year. So March of 2016, we uh, completed our training, and I was uh, crewed up with two Russian cosmonauts, um, Alexei and uh, Oleg, and uh, we went down to Kazakhstan from Moscow, the Moscow region, about 12 days uh, prior to launch. Uh, spent some time doing our final preparations there in Kazakhstan, and then on, uh, they got the rocket on the launch pad two days before lift, uh, our launch day, and then we, on launch morning, we got in our suits, uh, took uh, the ride out to the launch pad, did the traditional wave here, and then got on the elevator uh, to get to the top of the rocket uh, and strap in about two and a half hours before liftoff. Uh, you see us coming in through this uh, hatch. If you're claustrophobic, you're in the wrong business. I get that question a lot, so none of us are. Uh, we actually get in the seats on our back in the fetal position, and I liken it to triplets in the womb. Alexei Ovchinin was uh, the commander of the Soyuz. That was his daughter's little stuffed animal there that he flew for her as a souvenir. We also call it the zero G meter. Hangs on a string until we get to orbit, um, and then uh, it bounces all over in the video, and some of you have seen that uh, on uh, uh, launches of Soyuz. Takes less than nine minutes to get to orbit, just like the space shuttle, after which you're going 17,500 miles an hour, or about 25,000 kilometers per hour. Uh, and then we set up the rendezvous uh, to rendezvous with the space station less than six hours later after launch. This is what the space station looked like as we approached it. Uh, and uh, this is what we looked like as we approached the space station, the final moments of approach as after we lined up with this docking port um, and then successfully docked. Uh, after which we did uh, leak checks between the two vehicles, got the hatches open, and we were welcomed on board uh, by Tim, Tim and Yuri, Tim Copra, American astronaut, Tim Peake, uh, British astronaut, the first and to date only British astronaut, and then Yuri Malenchiko, Russian cosmonaut. So that we rounded out the crew of Expedition 47, and that got us underway uh, in that uh, crew combination of six. Uh, here's a, a shot of the inside of the space station. Here we are in the U.S. segment going to the U.S. laboratory into the Unity module, which is the place that we uh, typically have our crew meals. So we have our, all our food there and we gather around. Uh, typically, it's a crew of six at least a couple times a week. Uh, other than that, we're kind of busy uh, spread to the four winds, but uh, we try to do that to maintain crew cohesion. You can see it's very easy to, uh, to move around there. You just get yourself moving in the right direction. Um, and get there and then stop. We had a very busy first few weeks uh, after we had arrived. It seemed like it, in every major activity was on a weekend. We had three supply ships uh, show up the first three weekends we were there. The first one was a Russian progress and then we had this orbital sciences Cygnus uh, bring up a, a almost 6,000 pounds of cargo and supplies. Um, and then a week later we had a SpaceX Dragon uh, show up. Uh, and you'll see from after this video that logistically supplying the space station is a, is a, a very um, intensive activity that's ongoing uh, for, for obvious reasons and other reasons that maybe aren't so obvious. That particular SpaceX had a unique uh, cargo on board. It was called the BEAM module. B-E-A-M is the acronym. It stood for the, or it stands for the Bigelow Experimental Activity Module. It's the first inflatable module that we've integrated onto the space station. So we got it attached to uh, the space station 
And then a few weeks after that, we got around to inflating it, just uh, allowing air from the inside of the, uh, where we are in the space station into this new module. And it was designed then to, to, uh, to inflate, to expand and increase its internal volume. Uh, and it's a great example of technology development uh, that the space station is intended to be a platform for. Uh, to develop new technologies for future application and inflatable modules uh, can be, they're volumetrically efficient to launch under a rocket fairing and then get to uh, where you need it. Uh, so it's a very promising technology. Uh, and here's the moment of celebrating that, that milestone in our stay uh, last year. It'll stay on board the space station for several years uh, as it proves out its technology. To Jeff Williams. And with that, we fast forward into June and uh, Expedition 47 comes to an end. We transition to Expedition 48. We have a, an old Navy tradition up there where we ring the bell uh, for the change of command. So I took command uh, from Tim Copra and uh, Tim, Tim and Yuri then got ready to, uh, to uh, return home uh, to get back into their Soyuz. We got the hatches closed. They got in their spacesuits, uh, strapped into their seats and then undocked from the space station after their six months stay, and this was about three months into our stay, uh, after their six months stay and they returned to Earth. So now for about three weeks, there are just three of us on board. And I liken it to, um, it's a great time that when you go down to a crew of three, have a little fun. I liken it to when your family comes for a holiday and they stay for a week or two. You know, it's a great day when they arrive and it's a great day when they leave, right? <laughs> Uh, for that three weeks, it was a very quiet uh, place on board the space station with just three of us spread out doing our own thing. But the work continued, uh, both uh, in categories of maintaining the space station, running it, repairing the things that break, which we're prepared to do, uh, as well as the science and research that's ongoing. In the meantime, there are three others, uh, again, at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, preparing to launch after they've completed their training. And in this case, we got uh, rookie astronaut Kate Rubens, uh, first time flyer from NASA, uh, rookie astronaut Takusha, uh, to, uh, Takuya uh, Onishi, a Japanese astronaut, it was his first time, and Anatoly Ovenishin, a, a second time flyer uh, from Russia, a Russian cosmonaut. So uh, I've given you a sense of the international flavor of, of this as well uh, among crews. Uh, so two days after they launched, they docked to the space station. Uh, we got the hatches open and welcomed them on board. Um, and they rounded out what became Expedition 48. Uh, and uh, so that was in uh, June, uh, I'm sorry, early July of last year. Um, and it's uh, always fun to welcome, especially rookies on board, uh, so you can share the experiences, all the highlights and experiences of space. We do a lot of science and research on board. This is a, a shots of an example of one of those. It's called SPHERES. Um, which is an acronym. It's a, it's a uh, technology development uh, program of, uh, of uh, control system development for satellites. And uh, it's been on board for 11 years now. I think the first time I executed a SPHERES experiment was in 2006. It's also used for student uh, activities. Here's another experiment, very uh, unique. The, this, these are human heart cells grown from stem cells that uh, and I learned for the first time that cells, our heart cells, beat at the cellular level. It's not the muscle tissue, it's the cells that talk to each other um, and beat in unison. The study of the human body is a major category of the activity that goes on up here. And here's uh, some shots of uh, Alexei and I participated in an experiment called fluid shifts to better understand the impacts on the human body in that weightless environment of space primarily to prevent or to, pr to uh, produce countermeasures for those adverse effects uh, for future exploration. We have a very unique facility on board the space station uh, in, in the Japanese module. It's an airlock that allows us to put experiments and cargo outside, grab it with a robotic arm, and either deploy it for a long duration outside or deploy it from the space station itself, such as these CubeSats uh, that were put up by the company NanoRex, uh, which we pointed the robotic arm out into deep space and then uh, they were commanded to be jettisoned uh, one or a pair at a time. Uh, so that's a, an example of a deployable payload that you would have the potential to get into um, and participate in. Fast forward into uh, the end of July now and it's time to receive another uh, SpaceX uh, Dragon capsule which was launched from uh, Cape Canaveral in Florida. 
again, bringing up uh, additional load of supplies, equipment, uh, and a new round of experiments, uh, research activities, but also a very unique special cargo we call the International Docking Adapter, which you see here being plucked out by the robotic arm. Uh, that was to be attached at the very front end of the space station. It also meant that Kate and I needed to get ready uh, for two spacewalks uh, to go outside because we needed to do a spacewalk to integrate that docking adapter onto the very front end of the space station. A spacewalk is definitely a highlight of the experience. Uh, it's a, a long day activity, getting ready to get out the door. Uh, and then we, when we go outside, we stay out for about six and a half hours is the typical planned time uh, for a spacewalk. It's a very challenging environment to work in. Uh, it's physically and mentally, it's the most demanding thing uh, that we do. Uh, but it's also the, one of the more rewarding things to do and memorable, thing, memorable things to do. Uh, it's one thing, obviously, to be in space in the spacecraft. It's quite another thing to get into suit and go outside and climb around uh, the outside of the spacecraft. The, the, the uh, two spacewalks that we did, one to integrate the DAC and adapter, and then two weeks later we went back outside uh, to do a variety of other tasks, were very successful. Um, and it was, uh, that's one of those highlights, uh, Kate being the rookie, on the crew to take her through uh, that experience for the first time, and she did very well. I'm very proud of her. It also occurred to me, space station's been flying a long time. Kate is just a couple years older than my older son, so we're we're on. Uh, the space station is a multi-generational program, with still a bright future ahead of it, uh, years ahead. Uh, one of the favorite places on the space station is what we call the cupola. I call it the window on the world. This was integrated on the station in the spring of 2010. It's the one place where you have six radial windows and then a center window, sort of like a hemisphere of windows, where you can see the entire globe from a, a one vantage point. Uh, so it quickly becomes the favorite place for everybody uh, to go during their free time. And, uh, of course, I took a lot of photography up there not only from the cupola, but from all the windows uh, on the space station to capture the details of the Earth's surface, like this plankton bloom off the coast of South America, or this horizon shot where you see the thin atmosphere and then these uh, beautiful cloud formations. The western U.S. with Central Valley just right of center there coming into view where you see the uh, Sahara and, uh, and the, the place where so much is grown uh, for food. Here's a uh, the largest coral reef in the Bahamas, uh, one of the most beautiful reefs in the, in the world, in my opinion. Uh, ice flows off the coast of Canada early spring 2016 last year. Here you see irrigation circles in the riverbed and the arid land around it uh, in, the, in the state of New Mexico. The southern tip of South America and the Patagonia ice uh, uh, shelves and the beautiful glaciers that occur there and the rugged landforms around it. Uh, this is in the Great Salt Desert, uh, sand domes, they're called, in Iran. Uh, very unique uh, geology in the world. Here's a, a shot of the horizon right after sunset. Uh, so the orange is from the sun, producing the silhouette from the, the weather uh, and cloud formations. They're just absolutely beautiful, incredible examples of what you can see from that vantage point. Here are the Alps in uh, southern Europe. Uh, looking straight down through an 800 millimeter lens into the Grand Canyon and the Colorado River. Here are the Teton National Park in the state of Wyoming. Very unique uh, shot of what we call noctilucent clouds over the poles, very r rarely seen. Typically in the summertime you see it over the north, in our wintertime you see it over the south pole. Uh, but very mysterious formations we theorize are ice crystals well above the altitudes that we see at normal weather. And I relinquish the command to Anatoly. That takes us into early September of last year, and now you're getting the rhythm of life, right? Uh, so we're at the end of our stay. I handed over command to Anatoly Ovenitian. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I really enjoyed the time we spent together at Expedition 48 on the International Space Station. And that milestone began Expedition 49. It also marked our re time to return to the planet uh, that we call home. <clears throat> so three of us uh, uh, said goodbye to the other three, uh, got in our Soyuz, got back into those uh, spacesuits that we launched in, strapped into our seats, and prepared to undock from the space station. The time from undocking to uh, uh, touchdown in central Kazakhstan 
is typically about three hours and 15 or 20 minutes. So the whole process happens fairly quickly. We uh, undock from the station, fire the, the engines to separate to get a safe distance from the space station. Then a couple hours later, flying over the southern tip of South America to land in Kazakhstan, we fire the main engine for a little over four minutes. That sets us up to now re-enter the atmosphere, literally entering in a fireball. That's what you see looking out the porthole window there. Um, and pull, experiencing about four times the force of gravity. And then the main parachute opens, which I like to say is the most significant event of the entire flight. Um, and then you drift down under the parachute for about 12 minutes um, and touch down in what I liken to be a car wreck um, uh, in central Kazakhstan. In our case, search and rescue forces had spotted us as soon as the main parachute opened uh, and they had us out of the capsule within 30 minutes or so. Um, we did some medical experiments there at the landing site along with the, the standard medical checks. And then uh, each of us got in a helicopter and flew about two and a half hours back to uh, the airfield that they were based out of. And then my Russian crewmates got on an airplane and went to Moscow. Then I got on another airplane here and did uh, three legs back to Houston. And I was back at home, reunited with my family in Houston about 24 hours after landing in central Kazakhstan. Incidentally, I, earlier today I told the story about uh, we all have experience of travel certain distances, maybe even if it's around the block or halfway around the world, we go on a trip, we come back, we might pull into, pull up in front of our, our house and we feel like, oh, we're home. Or we might uh, fly in from somewhere from another country and land, land at Chang and you feel like, I'm home. In this case, as soon as the motion stops, after you impact the ground in central Kazakhstan, you tumble and roll, and then you're hanging in the straps and you're feeling the relentless force of gravity again, you feel like we're home, even though it's in the middle of nowhere on the other side of the planet. So a very interesting uh, psychological detail, I guess. Thank you so much, Commander Williams. I just love seeing these videos each and every time. It's just so um, awe-inspiring. Um, so we wanted to get started by asking you a couple questions and then opening it up to the audience because I'm sure you guys have questions too. So what I'm basing this on is some questions that were submitted, submitted by some of you guys um, earlier. So um, since we are talking about products here, can you list some examples of well-designed products that you used daily in space? And were there any products that you thought could possibly be improved? Just about everything we use can be improved, right? <laughs> <laughs> You guys work in the business where, you know, you got users out there, you got developers and, uh, and producers of products, and then your users give you feedback and say, hey, we don't like this. And if you've been in development, you, you, or you do anything, you put anything nowadays out in social media or in the internet, you get comments back, right? Not all the comments are, are positive. So, there, I mean, we can always make improvement in everything, and that's certainly true with what we do. Um, it's a, you know, there are a lot of moving parts to the operation up there, um, and there's a, a great team of folks, um, not only at NASA, but in all the, the entire partnership, uh, that work 24-7, uh, 365. They're working all the time in Mission Control in Houston, in the Mission Control in Moscow, in the Control Center in Scuba, Japan, another one in Munich, Germany, um, and those folks are working all the details overnight, planning the, the day's activities. Of course, they've been planning for months, uh, but the, they, they refine the plan right up until when we, when we go to bed at night, overnight, uh, they've finalized the plans for the next day. There's a lot of details in that, a lot of what we call ops products, operational products, just like procedures um, and other uh, resources that we need uh, to execute the day's plans. Um, and, and overall, we do a very good job but we're always in, in need of, of making that process more efficient and more effective. So that would be one example. Yeah, so I'm sure there are ways we could streamline a lot of stuff. So how about a product that you wish existed, that when you were up there, what would you have loved to have that you didn't have? The ability, the ability to beam home for the weekend. <laughs> Actually, I'm kind of a minimalist by nature and uh, I've spent my whole career in the Army so I can eat a, a ration and sitting in a foxhole in a pouring rain. Um, 
so there wasn't a whole lot that I personally missed up there. I, I mean, I went there like it was a, it was going to be a trip where you don't have a lot of luxuries that, that we take for granted. So, but you know, we we need uh, we always need the equipment to do the job, right? To accomplish the mission. Uh, so that's where the key comes in. How how can we improve all the different elements that uh, that are involved in accomplishing the mission to make it more effective, more efficient, and, and safe. Um, so then let's um, touch on one of the points that I brought up with regard to um, asteroid mining. What are your thoughts on orbital vehicle assembly from asteroid so sourced material? Well, frankly, I haven't taken the time to see what kind of material are on asteroids. Uh, but just answering the question in a more generic way, uh, let's say they're going to Mars, for example. Um, you, you mentioned earlier that uh, we have to uh, take a lot of things from Earth. We have to support it from Earth. The space station, you saw supply ships coming and going continually just to supply and support everything that was required to not only do the work on the space station, but to, perform, uh, to support the life of the crew. We all eat every day, we, uh, we breathe the air. Uh, that has to be maintained. Uh, all of the things that we take for granted here on the surface of the Earth uh, that provide support for life have to be duplicated there. So you have to supply that, you have to sustain it, and you have to have the, the, uh, the equipment that has the reliability and the performance necessary uh, to do so. When we go to Mars, it's going to uh, be uh, orders of magnitude more critical because we won't have easy access to send a spare part, to send a replacement part, uh, to um, uh, compensate for a lack of performance or reliability in those systems. So that means there's going to be a, a huge requirement to send a lot of stuff ahead of time uh, before a crew ever goes to get there. Now, if you can reduce that, requirement of upmass of launch and stuff from Earth, if you can reduce it by tapping into whatever resources you find there and then have automated systems that can then turn those resources into the commodities that you need uh, to uh, do the operation on the surface and or provide the means to return to Earth, then you've cut down on the, on the, the upmass requirement. Yeah, and so that's actually one of the biggest expenses, isn't it, the launch itself. So this is where you guys come in, 3D printed space parts from asteroid dust, right? Think ah, about that. Yes. Yeah, I think that would be cool. And we have uh, off-the-shelf 3D printers on board the space station right now, so we're basically developing the operation, proving out the operation that we can do it, whether it be um, a, a design of something that gets uplinked from uh, the ground, and, uh, and the crew just supports the printer itself and, and, um, and um, does the, the inspection of the product or if the crew has interactively designed something on board. But that's going to be a key component and that's a great example of then drawing from the raw materials that you have. Okay, so um, we had another question, as we often do, um, about movies. So which is your favorite space movie and which one is your least favorite? <laughs> Um, yeah, <laughs> somebody said gravity. I got so many questions uh, when that movie came out after in the weeks afterwards. You know, every every time I'd run into somebody and if they learned what I did, you know, oh, did you see the movie? Did you see the movie? I'd say, no, I haven't had time to watch the movie. And I, and I, it was was that a three D movie? I forget. It, it could be right it, on the big screen. Of course, it had all the special effects and and whatnot. I finally watched it, but uh, I'm going to disappoint you, I know. I saw it on a little screen on Singapore Airlines on a direct flight between Houston and Moscow uh, because I was going there for one of the training trips, and I had, I had other things to do, but I thought, well, I'm going to watch this movie so I can answer the question. Um, so, I mean, it was entertainment, although i, I got to be careful because this is going out, right? Um, but it, you know, it didn't have much of a storyline. It had, uh, <laughs> and the guy at the beginning scene, you know, out doing a spacewalk like you saw there in the video, flying around in the jetpack. That time. we don't do that. Um, and of course, the collision, the catastrophe that uh, they experience is nothing like uh, real physics. So there, there's a lot of uh, liberties taken in that movie, but I suppose it was it was entertainment. So I, I would say. 
Uh, I'll mention that one. Uh, I'll mention uh, the Martian because uh, the, that's another one that comes up all the time. And I think I saw that one on an airplane too, actually. Uh, I don't get to the theater very often. Uh, but it, it, it was uh, actually a, 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 a pretty good movie to watch. Of course, it, they took some liberties like you always do in, in movies. Uh, but it's, uh, it's one of those examples, I think, that uh, can help the public be inspired about, hey, this is possible. Right now, it might be science fiction, and there was a lot of uh, liberty taken in that movie. Uh, but this is something that's actually possible. You know? and, and you can go back into as early as the 30s uh, that I recall, and, and there were movies that were made about putting up people in space, in space stations. Uh, Von Braun had a great vision that, that was articulated through the 50s with the help of Disney and whatnot. And we are still in the process, by the way, of executing the vision he articulated in the mid-50s, which was, let's get into space, into orbit, launch people into orbit, build a space station, go to the moon, on to Mars. That was his order. Of course, we did it in a little bit different order. Uh, so anyway, back to the movies. Those movies are fine. The best movie, if you want to know, when I get the question, what's my best space movie, and which is the one I like the best, it's Apollo 13. Because they did an excellent job of telling the story, a true story, and uh, telling it in a way that was representative of the real world. Uh, so Apollo 13 is one that uh, I really appreciate. Well, yeah, that was a good movie. So I'll just say for me, The Martian is my favorite movie because they made scientists look really cool. <laughs> but they also did take liberties because um, when they showed JPL from the outside, it was um, a shiny new structure, stainless steel and glass. And when you went inside, they had all these sleeping pods and really cool places. I had a World War II desk that you couldn't really open the drawers on. We had the latest and greatest in spacecraft hardware, but this being a government agency, the inside was not as shiny, and I didn't know anybody who drove a Mercedes. <laughs> so um, let me just ask one more question, if I might, before we open it up to the floor. Um, you mentioned the movie um, Gravity, and you talked about debris. So um, in the context of the ISS, um, how does the uh, station deal with debris, and what kind of issues do you typically face? Uh, well, I think most folks are aware of the, the issue of space debris. Uh, there is a lot of it up there. Of course, the, the space is big, um, but there's a finite probability of, uh, of uh, and risk uh, produced by the debris at the altitudes that the space station flies. Uh, the larger objects are tracked and uh, kept track of, and if, if the predictive models show that um, an object, a single object, is going to approach within a certain sphere of the space station. In advance, we'll even do a maneuver of the space station. Occasionally, the predictive models don't pop up that, um, uh, that intersection, if you will, until it's too late to do a maneuver, and then the crew will do a, uh, 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 go to a safe haven, which is the Soyuz capsule, hang out in their Soyuz capsule until that object is passed. So we, we prepare for those, uh, those uh, real risks that are out there, uh, but that's how we mitigate at least the larger objects. And when I say larger, those are objects longer than, say, like this, just a few inches long. It's the smaller objects that we can't track and we can't predict, uh, uh, and there is a finite probability of impact with the station. Uh, we have several emergencies that we prepare for on the space station, and number one, and one that I think that uh, um, we need to take most seriously because of the consequences and the probability of occurring, especially when you consider the years and years that the space station has been flying and will be flying, is an impact by a small object which would uh, produce, of course, a depressurization. Uh, so we uh, developed the procedures to respond to that, uh, and all the crews are trained uh, with the first priority, of course, the, the safety of the crew, and the second priority is to save the space station. So. We have procedures that would uh, that would isolate the location of the leak and then isolate that module, um, save the rest of the station. All right, so um, I'm wondering if anybody in the audience might have any questions. We have a mic out there somewhere. Hi, my name is Ankur Gupta. Uh, I wanted to ask a question that 
when you're in space, does your sense of time and perception slow down, or does it stay the same? Because everything is moving so slow. Uh, the perception of time, just like on the planet, is driven by how busy we are, right? We can get bored and not be very busy, occupied with things, and it seems like time drags on. Uh, but if we're under a lot of pressure to get some things done and we stay busy, then it seems like the day flies by. Uh, so you have the same thing up there, except that we don't get bored up there. We have the latter case uh, because the, the schedule is filled. Now, what we don't have, and I think this might be what you're pulling at a little bit in the question, we don't have the, the day-night cycle and the cues of the sun rising, uh, uh, you know, prompting us to get up, to wake up and get up and, and uh, get busy for the day, and then it gets dark again, and we know shortly after that, it's typically for most of us, time to go to bed. We don't have that up there. We don't have those cues. So everything is uh, worked off the clock. Uh, so we've got uh, um, a, a local area network spread throughout the space station with uh, laptop computers, and on those laptop computers uh, are many products, one of them being the schedule for the day, and each crew member has assigned tasks to do with all of the, the materials necessary to accomplish those tasks. And it's got a little vertical line across this window that has a schedule on, and the vertical line is the current time and it marches across the day's schedule, so you find yourself chasing that line all day long to stay ahead of schedule. Uh, but it, you're, you're tracking, okay, what, what are you doing next? So I'm continually setting the alarm on my watch uh, to make sure I meet those milestones. Now, I'm pretty good now, after spending time up there of working, getting ahead and staying ahead. So my alarm was always going off uh, so that, okay, one minute from now, I gotta be in the window to take a picture of this target. So that's what, uh, what I was tracking. And we have those tools on board, too, to, uh, to predict, for example, when we're going to fly over at the precise second, Singapore or anywhere else in the world. So um, you talked about the lack of day-night cycles. You guys orbit the Earth every 90 minutes, right? Yes. So you're seeing sunset and sunrise throughout the day. Yeah, 16 times a day you can see a sunrise and then a sunset if you, if you have the time to go to the window and watch it. Question from the audience. Hi, my name is Jill from Google. I'm curious to find out how you stay fit, um, not only physically, but spiritually, mentally, all of it. Great question. Uh, physical fitness is very important up there be, for obvious reasons. We all use our muscles just to support our bodies, even sitting in chairs like we are right now. Uh, and when you're in a weightless environment, the muscles don't have to do any work. Uh, so they will atrophy, and not only the muscles, but our bones will atrophy as well. Our bone strength, the density of our bones, calcium density, is dependent upon exercise. That's why exercise is so important. It's emphasized as children grow up, etc. Uh, so we have countermeasures on board. We exercise every day, uh, and we'll do aerobic and anaerobic exercise. The aerobic exercise uh, includes running on a treadmill. And you say, how do you run on a treadmill without gravity? Good question. We wear a harness. Uh, each person has their own harness, and then we have bungees that uh, uh, are attached to the harness down into the treadmill. We can vary the load uh, and the speed of the treadmill, and I typically ran for 30 minutes, four, uh, four miles or so uh, every day. Um, if you didn't want to run, you could uh, cycle on a cycle ergometer uh, and get your aerobic exercise that way. In addition to that, uh, we had the equivalent of weightlifting. We called it resistive exercise, uh, and we used uh, vacuum cylinders to provide the force that, that to replace uh, l weights, you know, with weightlifting. And um, that is a very important countermeasure uh, to keep the main muscle groups, the, 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 the core of our uh, body, uh, uh, and, uh, and support, you know, legs, uh, um, and why not back uh, strong and also to keep the bone density up. Uh, so uh, every day we lift it uh, and it would include things like uh, body or uh, squats or deadlifts uh, um, and then other kinds of exercise as well. So that was uh, how we uh, maintain our fitness uh, and the equipment we have on board now is very effective, more effective than we had in earlier years um, and it, it's a uh, does a couple things. It, it, it tells us a couple things. One is it, uh, it tells us how important um, the study of the human body is up there so that when we leave Earth orbit, we have the countermeasures developed 
um, to, uh, to counter those adverse effects and maintain a healthy crew for the duration of the mission as well as your, the rest of your life when you get back on Earth. Um, uh, and it also is a great example of the primary purpose of the space station, that is developing those technologies, developing the operations to enable us to leave Earth orbit. Uh, psychologically, spiritually, uh, support, of course, that's uh, very important as well. Uh, one of the primary ways that we're able to uh, maintain our uh, psychological support, uh, and we all can relate to this, we all have relationships. Human beings are relational beings. Uh, we are, whether we might think ourselves as being very independent, but we're all dependent and having relationships with others, and that's important up there as well. Uh, in that respect, you can get very isolated, even though you're on a crew of six, uh, being separated from the family. And perhaps more significantly, we're up there, we're very busy, we're focused, we're doing our jobs, but our families are back home. And, and they, for my wife in particular, uh, what I'm doing is completely out of her control. So the endurance that she has to go through is, uh, I think, much more challenging than what I had to go through. Uh, that requires support both ways. Uh, a key element of that support is just communication which goes back to the relationship. So we have great connectivity up there in terms of being able to make voice phone calls once a week uh, through uh, the assets at uh, Mission Control in Houston. We would have a video conference, two-way video conference. So that, that was the one time a week that I could see um, uh, friends and family from the ground. Uh, we also are, have the opportunity to make contacts with other friends and family uh, throughout the world. Uh, limited, obviously. We have internet connectivity, very limited. Uh, you can't stream even audio on the connectivity we have. It's like the old dial-up days for you, those of you old enough to remember that. Uh, but, but we've got a team of folks on the ground that, uh, that help support us uh, in that respect, and they do a very good job. So we've spent a lot of time thinking through those requirements. So I uh, just wanted to understand uh, two questions I have. Uh, what research or thing you're doing on space station which can have immediate relevancy to a problem on Earth? So which we can't solve on Earth, but we are doing something in space which we bring back to Earth and solve a, a significant problem over here. That's part one of the question. Part of the question is if things start going wrong over there, what are the things you have in place to correct them that suddenly things are going haywire on the space station? So. What are the measures you have to bring them back into control? We train for years to prepare for a flight. And I'll take your second question first. Um, and uh, much of that training uh, has to do with dealing with things that go wrong. Something breaks as uh, an emergency on the space station. We have a, 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 a caution and warning annunciation uh, because some system failure or, or what have you. Uh, so we're trained to respond to that. The, the, the minor failures that we have are covered by the redundancy in the design of the system. So you have, uh, say, uh, a relatively minor, uh, uh, and this is all relative, right? But something fails, a redundant system automatically comes up and picks up the function uh, for that system. But there are other major ones where uh, we can have significant failures where the crew has to get involved and, and has to be trained to uh, to respond to that. Our mission control centers around the world also are key in that uh, response. And as long as we have uh, telemetry and communication between the ground and the space station, they're there looking over our shoulders and, and perhaps in many cases, they're prime in the response uh, to it. So we, we train for all the possibilities of all the things that might go wrong. And uh, we have the procedures in place um, and, of course, uh, from the training, execute those procedures. Uh, uh, so I think that covers, in general, the, the second question. The first question, um, a direct application where it immediately was applied to the ground, um, that's a really broad question. Uh, we have, uh, of course, what we call spin-offs, and you can go, I'll point you to the NASA website, where you get your, somebody said you're two clicks away from oblivion, but you guys, we're, you're, we're here at Google. We're all, we all can relate to that, right? When you get out into the internet, there's so much information out there. But you can uh, find an endless list of, of uh, spin-off technologies, a lot of the things we take for granted, that can be traced back either directly or indirectly to uh, space exploration. Uh, 
Um, and then that includes, of course, the, the examples across the, the spectrum. Um, a lot of the science and research that takes place, it's like research anywhere, right? It's really hard to take a, a specific narrow scoped research activity and say, hey, how does this make a difference you know, out in the real world? Well, it doesn't necessarily make a difference tomorrow or the next day or whatnot, but it contributes to a, to a broader and a deeper body of knowledge that then it develops into a technology or a capability that has a direct impact to the world. So uh, that's how I would generically answer it. So yeah, so I got a little excited there and interrupted you, sorry. Um, so one of the things that we do is we actively look at the research that's currently being done to be able to build on it. Um, and the cool thing is this is all very new. So anything, any ideas that you come up with have not really been you know, tested to the full degree. So even high school students are able to put experiments up there. Um, one really nice example I like to um, think about is, um, so Commander ref referred to bone loss, osteoporosis. There um, is a bone loss drug that's an injectable that's in common use now. Um, they have $700 million of revenue a quarter. It's, it's crazy, they're so successful. But um, in order to test the, um, the drug, they had to go through animal clinical trials. And what they did was they sent a bunch of mice up into space, onto the space station, and then um, and before that even on the shuttle, induced osteoporosis in these mice very quickly and then tried the drug on them. And they were able to reduce the um, time to market by shortening the clinical trial period from two or three years down to something like uh, three or four months. So if you do the math, you think about how much quicker it went to market, that's a huge savings for them. And that was the kind of thing that they could only do in space, something that you know, was not possible to do here on Earth. And there are lots of other examples like that too. So as, as, as Commander suggested, you can go and look on the websites. Hello, uh, my name is Grigori. Uh, what are recycling capabilities of a space station? What can be recycled here or, and what need to be brought from Earth? And the uh, second question is, uh, how do you eat there? So after you swallow something, it reaches uh, your stomach because it's falling because of uh, gravity on Earth. Do you need to do special maneuver to, for, <laughs> for this to happen? And, uh... Actually, the, I'll take the second first, and I'll hopefully I'll remember the first question. Uh, but your, your ability to chew, swallow, all of that doesn't change up there. So you could probably stand on your head and swallow your food. I, I'm not, I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah. <laughs> but it doesn't, it's not impacted at all. I will say that uh, on occasion, uh, I've had a sense of heartburn. I've woken up in the middle of the night with a sense of heartburn. Uh, that might have been unique to the environment there. But even up there, it was very rare uh, for me. I remember it occurring on my first flight. I don't remember it after that. Um, so those functions stay pretty much the same. So you asked, the uh, first question had to do with recycling, right? Uh, on the space station, of course, we're maintaining the atmosphere. Um, and uh, that means feeding oxygen into the atmosphere as it's consumed in our breathing. It means removing carbon dioxide as it's exhaled and builds up because you can't tolerate a very high level of uh, CO2 uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, it means removing the humidity um, uh, that we breathe out or it turns into a rainforest uh, shortly, so you have to remove that. Well, all of those products that you, you're either well, removing, if you can recycle them, of course, you improve the closed loop efficiency of the, of the system. So we've got uh, for example, we, re we recover all of the humidity. Uh, we recover uh, the vast majority of the human liquid waste, urine, and all of that is collected and put through a, a, a process uh, to recycle it. And I, I don't remember the exact number, but I want to say we're on the order of 70 to 80 percent efficiency, somewhere in that range of recycling water. Uh, the carbon dioxide uh, let's see, some of, um, trying to remember what, where we're currently at, some of that is dumped overboard, some of it is reclaimed. We're adding technologies to what we were previously dumping overboard uh, where we can try to recover that as well. And, and eventually, you know, you want to get to close to 100% efficiency as possible in the closed loop system. Uh, we're not there yet, uh, and we have a long ways to go both in the, in the in, 
increasing that efficiency as well as increasing the performance of each component of recycling and perhaps more significantly the reliability of those components. Uh, access to space is difficult, I mentioned that before, but uh, access to the space station to low Earth orbit is relatively easy. So we, and the space station is huge as I described, so we have spare parts for just about everything up there and we can turn something around on the ground and maybe get a spare part up there within at least a couple months. Uh, but when we leave Earth orbit, even going back to the moon, access is going to be an order of magnitude uh, more difficult. And then when we go to Mars, it's going to be orders of magnitude more difficult uh, to be able to respond uh, to a failure of a system or a loss of redundancy or we won't be, we won't have the capacity to take a bunch of spare parts. So reliability of the system as well as the performance needs to be vastly improved uh, before we're able to, uh, to do that.